How, how could this happen? How could they treat people like that? They're the ones that rule, and if you want to, to supply them, you live by their rules. But unfortunately, they're one-sided rules, they're not general rules. Sainsbury's say they don't have a record of the Baileys, but they always work closely with suppliers, were the first to implement a supplier code of practice, and have worked with some for over a hundred years. Supermarkets have become more sophisticated, determined to make us spend more money. Phil is a convenience shopper. Today, he's the guinea pig for a company that designs supermarkets to make us buy more on impulse. The headset records what Phil looks at and responds to. It explores his supermarket psyche, his beta state. Understanding why we buy has led them on a journey deep into the subconscious of the shopper. What catches our eye? And why? One of the key things that we need to understand is about how people really make decisions. Most of the shopping we do is done subconsciously rather than consciously. So I need to try and find a way of exploring how these subconscious decisions are made. Afterwards, each area of shopping is analysed. Phil is about to discover that product placement can add pounds to your shopping bill. So a bit of decision making there, yeah. oh, product on a deal, it seems like you've got some approval there. Uh, now I would suggest you're probably still in meal mode here, but then something suddenly attracts your attention over to the left. Yeah. There's no way that you're thinking about buying Marmite next, but Not as your head yeah. swings round, you um, you alight on the colour yellow, and the association between the shape of that product and the colour yeah. yellow switches you immediately into Marmite, yes I want some of that, even yes. though you weren't even in considering buying the product at that particular point in uh -huh. time. The information is used by the supermarkets to seduce us to buy things we may not even want. I very much spend far much more than the budget we've got um, and buy far too many things probably that end up rotting in the bottom of the fridge. Over the years we've trained people to go through fresh produce and then into the fresh meat and so forth. And what they've done to respond to that change is to actually put the chilled, pre-prepared foods in that same area. It's almost to the extent that you're seeing people coming in with, oh, right, I'm going to have this big meal on Sunday, and I'm going, oh, that's a good idea. I could buy four of those, and that's done. Do you want frozen mint or fresh mint? Frozen. Extra lean. Smell's the quickest way to get a message to the brain. We've done experiments, for example, the smell of junipers in the, in the spirit section, and people go and buy gin. It's a, it's a real way of, of communicating with the subconscious rather than actually putting on a great big poster that says buy gin today. As he's walking around the store, the kind of things he's looking for are pictures of ready-made meals, of, of pre-prepared things. So um, I see a pizza, yep, that's fine, that's the sort of thing I want. So when he was wandering through fresh produce, whilst his eyes were darting all over the place, up here he's going on, this is nothing to do with me. Uh, this is not my world. Uh, we more than likely just love something in the microwave and eat a convenience two-minute meal after the time, um, which we regret, but you know, that's, that's a life relief. Phil probably describes the type of shopper that was growing and growing and growing. His function is about convenience. I want to do my shopping as quickly and conveniently as possible, and I don't really want to dedicate time uh, to food preparation once I get at home. Actually, there's more of a science to microwave cookery than you actually think. Because he might have a Marks and Spencer's dish which is five minutes to Michael's away. Mine might be six and a half. What to do? Who's goes in first? You had to put his in for a bit, then put mine in, then put his... Oh, then what about doing some peas? At home, it's almost like an a la carte restaurant. People queue up at the old fridge over there, take out their boxes. It could be four different meals in one family. Queue up at the microwave, ping cuisine. Five minutes later, they've got, they're sitting in front of um, Ainsley or myself watching the telly. The 80s souffled into the 90s, the era of the TV chef. The public loved them, so did the supermarkets. 
We've all learnt this new language of style. You can't have olive oil now. No, not plain old olive oil. It's got to be extra virgin. Or extra, extra virgin. Never been kissed, olive oil. <laughs> but once in a while, I'd like to get offered some olive oil that's been well shagged. Do you know what I'm saying? Now, when you go into a supermarket, you see a whole wall of olive oils. Olive oil, and you're only going to need a tablespoon or two. Celebrity chefs have been tremendously influential in how we perceive food today, at least. People are now interested in food. That's, that's really the incredible power that celebrity chefs have had these last 20 years. I want some oil, just about two or three tablespoons. Yeah, we've had to kind of take over, really. Um, you know, celebrity chefs are the only kind of mothers, really. And if your mother does teach you how to cook, then God bless you. Well done. Oh. I think supermarkets are always trying to get the public to trust them. And I believe by having chefs on board, they think that will create an element of trust. Anthony Worrell Thompson is one of many celebrity chefs who are constantly asked to promote products such as their influence. Every day I'll get something in the post, whether it be a publicity brochure, a box. I mean, this is a load of jams, which obviously they want me to promote in uh, maybe Christmas, I write for the Express, I do these taste testers. You know, they may want to get on telly, I don't know. But let's have another look. I mean, we get all sorts of bits of equipment. I mean, this is a nutmeg grinder, the most useful gadget in the world. Well, let's have a look at this box because, you know, sometimes you get some very, very weird products and you wonder how they're ever going to sell. And sure enough, it's verjuice. Now, most people would think, hmm, nice dinky little bottle of wine. Of course, it's gross to drink, but it's great in cooking. It's a substitute for lemon juice and for vinegar. But they'll want me to plug that in a column, and I doubt if I can do huge amounts. Get Delia. Now, there. Now we're talking. Delia till we use verjuice. The whole world would buy verjuice. By 1990, Delia was the unchallenged queen of the TV well, kitchen. Again, this week's programme is all about game and poultry, and we're going to kick off with a recipe for chicken. Sainsbury's pulled out their checkbook and made her their ambassador for food. Combination of ingredients. When Sainsbury's signed up Delia, that was a total coup. I mean, it was it was brilliant. Here was somebody you know that we all knew who was the expert in their field, who could give us sort of inspiration and ideas. I mean, we we're all short of that. It's, oh my God, what do I cook tonight? And here she was giving you the way and telling you how to do it. And all of a sudden, you know, there you are. The, the, all the um, uh, the product sells out because Delia says that's the thing to do. Then you turn it up and sit it up into a vertical position like that. Her husband publishes the Sainsbury's magazine, and I'm told that uh, Sainsbury's get a tip-off when Delia is going to promote something. Now, you start off in a saucepan with eight ounces of cranberries. In they go. And in fact, all the supermarkets get tipped off by Delia through the BBC before her programmes go out, which is just as well. The day after Delia used cranberries on her programme, Sainsbury's reported sales up 200%. Especially well with our riet of duck. Cranberries. I mean, tons and tons and tons of cranberries were sold when she pushed cranberries. Glycerine or glucose, I think it was. I mean, who on earth is going to buy glycerine or glucose to put in their icing or whatever it was? But they sold out. I mean, bombs. So there they are. And so the new weapon in retail warfare became the celebrity chef. Delia was just one of many names exploited for supermarket profit. Supermarket signed up loads of chefs, and I know some of them aren't happy with the products they're endorsing. Uh, so I prefer not to do that. Maybe one day, if someone wanted me for an organic range or something like that, then, then I'd participate. But at the moment, I feel I have a stronger voice, if you want, by being outside the supermarket sort of brotherhood. Any self-respecting TV cook could expect a call. Brian Turner, a Tesco consultant. Rick Stein, also a Tesco recruit. Lloyd Grossman of MasterChef, again, Tesco. Michelin starred Raymond Blanc, taken on by upmarket Waitrose. Then in the late 90s, Sainsbury's hit back, hiring the young pretender to the throne of food fashion, Jamie Oliver. 
garlic, lemon grass, coriander, a bit of coconut milk. I do think 